Why, hello, world, and hello to Vladimir, who's kindly holding our cameras today. My name is David Malin. I teach CS50, which is taught traditionally in Sanders Theater in a building called Memorial Hall on Harvard's campus here in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Wonderfully today, our friends who run Memorial Hall have led us into the attic so we can explore the upper boundaries of the building and even step out onto the roof. So we thought we'd give you a little bit of a tour along the way. Come on in. Watch your head as we go into one of the inner attics of the building here. Memorial Hall was built in the 1870s, so quite a bit of time ago. And what you'll see in here is not only a lot of the original brickwork, but also woodwork, and then more modernly, a lot of the HVAC, or air conditioning and heat, that now keeps folks toasty and cool in Sanders Theater and in the other spaces downstairs. If you've ever watched the, the movie National Treasure with Nicolas Cage, it feels a little bit like that right now. So you'll notice here an angled roof. We're roughly over Sanders Theater itself, which is downstairs. If we take a look at over the edge of the railing here, you'll see some of the top roofing of Sanders Theater itself, which you probably haven't had occasion to look up at. But here we are in the bowels of this building, almost 150 plus years later. Besides Sanders Theater, Inside of this same building, Memorial Hall, is a much larger space, if you can believe it, known nowadays as Annenberg Hall. Years ago, it was called Alumni Hall, and it was used for some time for examinations and for other large gatherings. But most recently, as of the late 1990s, it actually became home to the first year dining hall, where freshmen eat breakfast, lunch, and dinner. In fact, I was class of 1999, and my class had the distinction of being the very first class to eat in the modernized version of Annenberg Hall with our meals. It was in the spring of 1996 that that part of the building opened. Come on down this way. Now in here you'll see quite a bit of mechanical work and if Vlad points the camera up you'll see the sheer height of this part of the building. Much of what's in here is not only the original bricks and the original wood but also as you can see a lot of noise and a lot of metal that keeps the building cooled and heated nowadays. Back in the day, though, there was actually a very large clock tower in the tower of the building, and this is before my time, but supposedly at one point, the clapper that hits the side of a bell disappeared at one point, and it was suspected that students from Yale University, our rivals in New Haven, Connecticut, might have absconded with it. It was never actually found, but to this day, it's suspected, apparently, that it was in retaliation for Harvard students back in the day having stolen Handsome Dan, or Yale's mascot at the time. Let's go up further. Now, this is the stairwell that's going to feel even more like national treasure particularly that part of the movie where the stairs all fall apart, frankly. So we're going to hold on to the railing here and watch our heads, but we're going to go up even higher and see if we can't get up onto the roof. Notice the very large archway here that I'm going to duck under. You'll notice along the right-hand wall here some metal supports that are keeping everything tucked in place, as well as some more recent, more modern lighting. But then to my left is all of the HVAC, all of the heating, all of the cooling that they crammed in here years ago when the building was modernized somewhat. The building itself was actually built as a memorial to those who died in the Civil War in the United States. And you can actually see in what's called the transept in the building a proper memorial whereby there are names of past soldiers and Harvard students and faculty and staff who were in the Civil War. Let's go ahead and step outside now if we can. And here we have Cambridge, Massachusetts, and our old friend, CS50 oh. Zone, Carter Zanke. Hey. Many thanks to the team of Memorial Hall who kindly let us pop up here today. And what you'll see now is a whole bunch of buildings, some Harvard, some Cambridge. This tall building over there is William James Hall, which is essentially the psychology building. Back in my day, in fact, I would volunteer for a bunch of psychology experiments, for better or for worse. They would pay you like 20 US dollars to participate for an hour or two, and you would eventually, if at all, find out what it was you had just participated in. 
Over there to the right is more of Cambridge and off to the distance, Boston, some of the taller buildings there. Boston's the larger city that Cambridge is adjacent to. Carter, pardon us as we finish the tour up here. And to the right is even more of Harvard. So down here is the edge of Harvard Yard, where a lot of dormitories are, where the students live, where the large library called Widener uh, Library is, Memorial Church is. And you'll see now just one of the towers here that was recently re uh, renovated of Memorial Hall. And then Memorial Church is slightly there off into the distance. But if we pan all the way up to the very top of Memorial Hall, which we won't climb up to today since we have frightening memories of having done this in the past. But up there, you can see actually a tower that was built on top of all of the brickwork of the building, including some Ghostbuster style gargoyles on the left and right. And that tower actually burned down in the 1950s. And in fact, on CS50's YouTube channel, we actually digitized some years ago a footage of the tower burning. No one thankfully was heard, but a passerby at the time who had a very old school camcorder at the time actually captured some of the footage, but it was high enough up on the building's height that the local fire departments, their hoses couldn't really reach that high. And so unfortunately the tower itself, the wooden tower burned, but a lot of the brickwork of course here remains. And in fact, it was also coincidentally in my day as an undergrad that they raised money to rebuild that tower. So I believe it was in 1998 or so, late 1990s, that it was reconstructed to look like it would have some 150 years ago. Well, that then is Memorial Hall, and this then is CS50, and of course, CS50's own Carter Zenke. Oh, fancy seeing you here. Indeed, what a pleasure to bump into you up here. Lad's gonna very carefully sit down on the edge of the building here. And we thought we'd, for fun today with our friend Max, um, hold some of CS50's office hours, if only to make it feel all the more like we are all here at Harvard, albeit an unusual spot. Um, this is not the kind of place that people can very easily sneak up to. So again, we're grateful to our friends in the building for letting us pop up here. It's getting a little cold, should we ask some Yes, why don't here? we dive right in <laughs> and then back up. All right, uh, one of my questions for you is, how long has CS50 been taught in Sanders Theater? CS50 has been taught in Sanders Theater since 2008. 2008? It was okay. the second year I taught it in 2007. The very first year I taught it, it was taught in a building called Seaver Hall, which is back over that way. Mm -hmm. um, we quickly outgrew the space, and so we, we graduated, if you will, to Sanders Theater. And do you know how many students can actually sit in Sanders Theater? It's about a thousand seats, which we've never actually needed ourselves, but for some of the very largest events on campus, particularly some of the acapella or musical performances, large gatherings of students, faculty, and staff, it can certainly be filled. Yeah, I know when I first saw it, I was very surprised at how small it feels, but also how many students can actually sit in there at one time. So it's pretty cool that way. Indeed, it's quite yeah. the experience. If you ever have a chance to travel to Cambridge, whether to visit Harvard or Boston or CS50 specifically, um, you should definitely try to come by. Yeah, if any more questions, we're going to actually ask them in the YouTube chat here. I'll be able to ask them to David. I'll take some myself and we'll go back and forth as we talk through your questions live here. Uh, one question for you though, David, is what is your favorite programming language? What is my favorite programming language? Uh, you know, it's funny you should ask because I got uh, asked this just two days ago down at Yale University and a, st a student of ours there asked. Um, and my answer then, as it would be now, is that I don't know if I really have a favorite nowadays. Mm -hmm. Like I, and I think we, CS50, use Python for almost everything nowadays, if only to standardize on one language that's easy to onboard people to. Um, I went through a phase years ago of really loving JavaScript. Mm -hmm. um, not actually the features we tend to use in CS50, which are very GUI or DOM-centric, but rather um, the asynchronous stuff and the single threading stuff, sort of slightly fancier features that you would get to if you studied more on your own or in a higher level class. Yeah, I think I'm right there with you. I'm kind of ambivalent right now, but I often reach for things like Python Python just because it's so easy to get started with. Yeah, so. agreed. And I yeah. actually do intellectually really like C. It's not a language I would really ever reach for unless I had a very specific uh, specialized application, but I actually really enjoy because of the control and the low-level details that it offers you. Yeah. I know we start with C in CS50, and it was kind of hard to design problem sets around that language. Yeah. But do you have like a favorite that is part of CS50 for that first part of the course in C? I've always really loved the recover problem set, which is one in which we give students a forensic image of sorts of photographs that have been deleted or corrupted on a memory card, and then they have to write C code to recover them. That was actually inspired by real life. Um, a former CS50 team member and friend of mine, Dan Armendariz, um, he was an avid and is an avid photographer, and he actually had one of his memory cards, I think it corrupted one. So he still had it physically, but for some reason his computer couldn't read it. And so at the time, I think I poked around online, read up on some C code that we could actually use 
use to recover the photos and we adapted it a little bit ourselves ran it and i think we got like 98 percent of his photos nice. and so that was actually the inspiration for what is now problem set four um inspired by a real world problem and we've actually had um, actual cs50 alumni email us a couple of years after taking the class to say that they too had actually used their c code to recover photos that got deleted or corrupted somehow yeah that's my favorite week i think in the class because you can do so much with the memory part of c um getting to like change the volume of files i found really fascinating because i was so into like electronic music when i was younger oh, so seeing nice, how i yeah. could like actually modify it using c was really cool for me yeah. yeah i will admit though i kind of love mario too even though the problem itself i don't think is nearly as fun as something like recover it's sort of become representative of cs50 because it's been there it's among the problems that have been there since the very uh, uh, first year that I taught CS50, so in 2007, and even though it's just ASCII art, it's sort of a nice way to sort of bring the gaming world, for instance, and, and programming to life. Yeah, and with sort of programming in CS50 nowadays, they're using Visual Studio Code to program. Do you have a favorite IDE you've used the past time? No, not really. In fact, don't tell anyone, but I rarely use VS Code myself. I actually tend to go old school and in a terminal window just open up Vim or VI, uh, uh, which is an older command line, but nonetheless semi-graphical program. Um, that said, I am starting to get on board with VS Code because there's just so many useful features. There's plugins, there's the AI functionality nowadays. So if I had to pick an ID, it would absolutely be VS Code, but I still tend super quickly to just open Vim in a terminal. It feels very hacker-like to just... Um, okay. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> and aren't there so many like uh, keyboard short Shortcuts for that? Like, what does it take to learn how to do VI or Vim? <laughs> you know, it's not actually that easy, though it is easier than another program that I dare say computer science type people like even more, mm -hmm. at least in some circles, called Emacs. Um, but Vim was actually, or VI at the time, was the program that we used in CS50 when I took it in 1996. Um, and I definitely learned a whole bunch of keystrokes, but I honestly, I don't think I've learned new ones since really then. And some friends of mine and former TFs are surely better at Vim than even I am. For some reason, I sort of got fixated in time there. Um, but you can actually use the key bindings, so to speak, as they're called, of Vim, of Emacs in VS Code by poking around your settings or using plugins to mimic them. So you can kind of get the best of both worlds. Um, but also, fun fact, don't tell anyone this either, when a student in office hours once years ago was actually themselves more comfortably using Emacs, I took over their keyboard to help with something, and I swear to God, I couldn't figure out how to like quit out of Emacs, <laughs> and I had to ask them, can you quit out of Emacs? Because it's some magical incantation that I'm sure is not actually very hard, but it was a little embarrassing. Only if you memorized it would you know, so. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Right. Okay, uh, switching gears a little bit, um, there's a lot going on with AI these days. Mm -hmm. And so have we made any updates to the AI course? Are we planning any updates to the AI course? Yeah, in fact, so Brian Yu's course on AI was updated just a couple of months ago, in fact, to update the very last of the lectures to focus that focuses already on languages, but to focus all the more now on aspects of large language models and in turn the GPT-like technologies that are being discussed in all corners nowadays. Mm -hmm. um, so even if you have finished Brian's CS50 AI class already, you're welcome just for fun to go back into it at csfd.edx.org slash AI and even just pull up the very last new lecture if you want to just absorb some of the new material and even the project uh, from that one week as well. Yeah. And are there other courses people should consider taking as they finish CS50X then? In general, not necessarily AI-centric, but a common go-to, and here, thanks for teeing this up, <laughs> yeah. is CS50's Introduction to Databases with SQL, which I think oh. you actually teach. Yeah, got to film that one in this past spring, which is now online on edX as of October 1st. And what so. do students get out of that class that they wouldn't get out of the week or so of CS50 in which we look at SQL? Yeah, so we take a week for SQL in CS50, but if you want to learn much more about that, not just how to query and do basic database design, but how to like actually design full-fledged databases, how mm. to um, answer more questions with data, I would really encourage you to take the SQL class. Yeah, and that's true of some of CS50's other follow-on classes too, like Brian's web class, aka CS50W, um, goes more into depth as to what you can do with web programming, and really does pick up where CS50's week nine or so leaves off. Um, our new class in cybersecurity also draws inspiration from the cybersecurity CS50X lecture that some of you might have seen, although I should note that CS50X 2024, which will go online, in January of 2024, um, we'll actually have a short but new um, lecture on artificial intelligence, which is actually inspired by, and much of the material was prepared by CS50's own Brian, um, who kindly let us incorporate it into CS50X now itself. Yeah, and when you're planning lectures for either CS50 or another course, how do you plan to make them engaging in the way that you do? Like, what goes into that? Oh, thank you. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think I probably try to imagine what kind of class, what kind of lecture, what kind of homework assignment like I myself would enjoy. I'm sort of 
very worried always about the audience being bored and so mm -hmm. I think anything I anything we can do to sort of bring the subject to life whatever that subject might be I do think is compelling otherwise like what's the point of us all being there if you can just read it in a book or read about it online if there's going to be something to be said experientially about either attending in person or watching live or on demand afterward together it would be nice to sort of motivate that time spent um, and so uh, there's a sense of theatricality as we've described it in recent years that I think permeates CS50 and as for the homework assignments, at the end of the day, if you really dissect them, you can really take the fun out of them quickly by just looking at the essence of what each problem set is. For instance, like Mario, it's really just about loops, like a for loop, maybe a while loop. Even the recover problem set is similarly about loops and a couple of conditionals. Now that said, that really does not sound all that inspiring. And so I think the trick is, or the key is to come up with some packaging, mm -hmm. some like real world motivation that actually makes the tools and the ingredients sort of subservient to the actual interesting goal, which is like recovering photographs or creating a pyramid that Mario might jump over. Yeah. I think to add on, I feel genuinely excited about some of the material we teach. Like, I really love it and feel excited about that. So it's about trying to learn how to channel that to other people can actually get the same excitement from it, too. Yeah, that's so, the hope. Yeah. yeah, no, I think some of the SQL classes projects are exactly in that same spirit. So if folks um, do like the world of databases and SQL, you should dive into those kinds of P sets next. Yeah. Would you want to take a scroll through the questions and see yeah, if there are any you want to? Take a peek at. All right, so let's see here. We have, uh, oh, you know what? My, my <laughs> gloves are relatively old and they've lost that ability to yeah. scroll, so <laughs> I'm going to take them off. They no longer conduct. Oh, my hands are getting pretty cold out here. Scrolling. So. All right, my turn then, I guess. <laughs> All right, so let's see. Let's see. So um, one student here asks, can the courses be multi-languages, which hmm. I'm going to interpret as meaning you could implement the homeworks in different languages? Yeah, so some of Steve Sissi's problems, that is, like maybe doing Mario, which is currently in C, perhaps in Python. Actually, you actually will do that in week, what is it, six of the course, when you actually learn how to use Python. You'll go back and implement some of the prior problems you've done in C, now in Python. And I think it is kind of a fun exercise to try one of CSH's problems in a new language, whether it is one we actually teach or something brand new for you, just kind of get a feel for how that language works and how you could learn the ins and outs of it. Nice. Yeah. And for those of you who are just joining, we are literally here on top of Memorial Hall, which is the building in which uh, Sanders Theater is, where CS50 itself is uh, hosted. So by all means, if you do have questions here in the live chat, please do feel free to ask them of us before it gets a little too cold <laughs> out here. All right. So I think at the bottom here in the live chat, this actually hasn't moved recently. So I'm mm. wondering if maybe, let's see. Well, let's see. We're going to go off script here. All right. So, so Carter, you've been with CS50 for a couple of years now, but your background is as much in or more in education than it is in computer science. Do you want to speak to the path that actually got you here? Yeah. So I think the path that brought me here is a little bit long, um, but primarily I found like a lot of excitement in computer science as a kid, like learning how to uh, make things with computers, like how to make music, how to um, make software, how to uh, like make video games too. And I always found that my own computer science classes didn't really touch on like how do I get the same excitement I felt in computer science from this field. Um, they didn't teach so much like programming as much as they did just like kind of typing at a keyboard, like how do you type well, how do you use Microsoft Word, and so on. So I found myself wanting to help share that excitement that I felt in computer science with others. Mm -hmm. Kind of what drew me to learning how to teach, how to um, engage a classroom. So okay. that's kind of what brought me here. Yeah. Nice. Well, we're glad it did. Thank you. We have had a few other questions come in during. Mm -hmm. And one of those questions was, how, how do you avoid taking long breaks while programming? Mm, how do you avoid taking long breaks? I actually think... I'm going to push back a little bit on that and say long breaks can sometimes be good for you. I think it depends because uh, some people are, uh, you know, it depends if you mean minutes, hours, or weeks. That's perhaps. true. Yeah. So I find it helpful to take a step back from a problem like overnight or um, even over the course of like a single day because I find I can come back and think about it in a new light. Um, but I also find it helpful to keep working on the same problem consistently. So I'm not taking like a week long break, but like a day break and trying to like come back to it so I have that same mindset that I had before. Okay, yeah. nice. And someone's asking about how easy C is versus Python. Like how mm. would you qualify them in terms of their accessibility? Um, I would say depends what you want to do with the languages. Um, what I like about C is that it's a very uh, kind of small language. They like can really learn all of C, I think, if you mm -hmm. wanted to. Python, on the other hand, is like a really big language. There are so many libraries and packages that it could take you a while to see all Python can offer you. So 
maybe a controversial statement, but I would say maybe sometimes C is often better beginning language to learn because it's so small like okay. that. Yeah. Okay, fair. But definitely challenging with aspects of it like pointers and memory for sure, more generally. For sure, yeah. And Carter, what do you recommend someone do after completing CS50X? Mm. I would say, so when you complete CS50X, you complete your final project. And I'd be curious to ask you where you could take that final project to the next level. Like, would you want to add AI to it? Would you want to do more databases? Would you want to think about it in a more secure context? You could use that to help guide you in your choice of classes afterwards, perhaps. OK, nice. Yeah. And another student here asks, is learning JavaScript worth it nowadays, particularly for a noob? No, sorry. I combined two questions. <laughs> yeah. Specifically for jobs, not for a noob. The noob was from a different question. Specifically for jobs. Uh, <laughs> I would certainly say so. So I think people are still using JavaScript. It's certainly uh, popular with web development. So if you're working for a place that works on lots of websites and trying to build things for the web, a good language to learn overall, I would say. OK, nice. Yeah. And do we have courses on web design with HTML, CSS, and Figma? For sure on HTML and CSS. I don't quite know on Figma. I don't think Brian touches on that in the web class. No, we don't. So this is actually a popular third-party application now for wireframing things, doing mock-ups and such. And fun fact, if you're familiar with Figma, no alliteration intended there, um, uh, at Figma now uh, is CS50's own Yuki Yamashita, who was one of our former head teaching fellows years ago and now is a very high-placed uh, executive within Figma mm -hmm. um, and has always had a talent for artistry and multimedia and design work. And in fact, he designed the very first CS50 sweatshirt and apparel, which mm -hmm. was a riff on the Harvard Department of Harvard Athletics uh, sweatshirt. And he made one for CS50 itself and so many other things as well. Yeah. How do you think we arrived at this like very basic, uh, like simplistic aesthetic in CS50? Uh, in terms of the logo? Yeah, like the logo, just CS50, like that's it. You know? Yeah, it's a good question. So CS50's text mark is designed in a font called Gotham, mm -hmm. um, which is a commercially available font that you two can use. Um, it was inspired in part by being at an impasse, like we couldn't really decide years ago if and what we wanted as more of a logo. And we toyed with lots of different things. And you can see some of the past uh, candidates online. Mm -hmm. We considered embracing the cat all the more. Before there was a duck, there was really a cat that was everywhere. Um, and nothing really quite felt timeless other than just saying CS50 itself. Mm -hmm. We considered stacking the letters. So it would be CS on top, five zero at the bottom. But we also wanted it to be readable and pronounceable in sort of a single breath. And so that's why it always reads left to right, even though that does make it a little longer. And as you can actually see here, <laughs> it's actually just quite nice. The font and a medium face, as we typically use it, really just lends itself to simplicity and elegance and hopefully timelessness. Um, so for now, I think it works pretty yeah, well overall. Yeah, it works pretty well too. Yeah. Nice. And wanted to put, circle back to AI, since a student commented that our speaker the other day, Dr. Matt Well, she's mm -hmm. a former Harvard faculty member, now with his own startup, formerly of Google and some other news as well, um, was fairly negative on the prospects for programming mm -hmm. and programmers because of the advent of AI. And I mm -hmm. wonder if you, and perhaps I in turn, have thoughts in response to that tech talk. Yeah. I mean, I think... In general, it's only good to be able to learn more about computer science, more about programming, so you can actually learn more about how AI actually works. And I think right now, to be able to guide an AI to do what you want it to do, you need to know about programming. You need to know what you want it to do in like a very concrete, um, kind of deep sense. So I think it's still worth learning all you can about computer science, about programming, so you can actually guide an AI to do what you want it to do in the end. Yeah, yeah, I too. I mean, Matt's title was deliberately meant to be <laughs> provocative. And in fact, I actually found it to be one of the most interesting talks we ourselves have hosted yeah. um, with friends of ours from industry um, in, in some time. And I think that, one, AI is absolutely going to change things. And I think it has already. I mean, CS50's own Colton Ogden, who teaches the games class, for the past couple of years has attested to just how useful he's found GitHub Copilot to be and easily a productivity boost for him of 20 30%. And I don't mm -hmm. think you can ignore that. That said, he's still a full-time software developer and I do dare say he's going to be that for some time but it's making him more productive and I think the most resonant thing that a buddy of mine at GitHub actually mentioned to me a few months back when I was asking him and a lot of my friends in industry what they think too because this is becoming a frequently asked question is he encouraged me to think about just how many GitHub repositories out there there are including some of our own that have open issues that is feature requests bug reports and the like and even now as much as we want to there are absolutely GitHub issues that we will never get around in CS50 alone to closing just for lack of time lack of um, sufficient time in the day people 
upon the team to actually get through all of our priorities as well as those other tasks. Um, so he encouraged me to consider just how much more productive we can actually be as, as humans, as programmers, as a society, if we can now amplify the impact of our work using something like AI. Mm -hmm. So I think in the near term, probably medium term, I really don't think folks have to worry. I would absolutely not change your academic or your professional path in terms of technology, because yeah. I do think as we even say in CS50, so much of what you're learning, it's not about C or Python or JavaScript, eventually of which are probably going to drift into less popularity, um, but it's really about how to think and solve problems, and that's not going anywhere. And I think that, and I hope that, frankly, programming eventually will become a little more like project management, whereby you or I, even if we are programmers and could write the code ourselves, it's gonna be way more efficient and productive to just tell the computer what to do, but to have the instincts for knowing what's possible and what it can do and how it how and whether it can speed up certain operations. So I do think, long story short, that being a software engineer, much like it has evolved in recent years to being a combination of operations and development, AKA DevOps, will similarly evolve even more into a product management role whereby using natural language or some domain specific language, we are really just telling the computers what to build for us and maybe we're tweaking, maybe we're fine tuning, but we're gonna be a lot more productive as a result. I think about our own students who on campus just transition from C to Python, how relieved they felt how much yes. more they could do. So maybe like this next step is just allowing you to do even more with less time of your own. So. Agreed, and we've seen this before. Those of us who learned HTML around the time this building was being repaired, um, were writing HTML and CSS like 1.0 from scratch. And then yeah. came tools like Dreamweaver, which was a very popular downloadable program for Mac PCs that generate HTML for you. And now we have Squarespace and Wix and other websites that generate HTML for you and static site builders that generate HTML for you. And web developers haven't gone anywhere. Their jobs have changed. I dare say they've gotten more fun, more productive. So I think we've seen evidence that as technology advances, it doesn't necessarily just eliminate roles, it changes them. And I think we've seen, at least in tech, it tends to be for the better. Yeah. It's kind of inspiring to me, I think, to think of how many shoulders you're standing on as you do what you're doing today. Like the people who first uh, programmed in assembly, then in C, then in Python, other languages. Like it's kind of like, you're standing on top of a lot of work from other people in the past, too. Yeah, mm -hmm. agreed. Well, I think we have time for just a couple more questions so we don't keep our friends from Memorial Hall out here on the roof with us for too long either. Um, one question that came in as we were chatting, Carter, is, yeah. is it okay to use the CS50 duck debugger uh, if, it, if the student faces an error? Absolutely, that's kind of why it's there for you. And actually, this is an adaptation of things like ChatGPT that can sometimes be a little too helpful. Like, it's, I think it's worthwhile for you as a learner to sit down and think through that error yourself. So the duck can help guide you through that error, but also help you like do the thinking yourself as opposed to telling you what, to, what exactly mm -hmm. what's happening, if that makes sense. Sure. Yeah. And this is a question about CS50P, which granted I teach, but perhaps you could offer an, uh, another perspective. Sure. A student notes that he's feeling very frustrated with the CS50P course, feels mm. like a total loser. How can I overcome that feeling and not give up after the first week? Which I don't think is that uncommon, really, with programming in general. Yeah, I was going to say, I don't think that's quite an uncommon sentiment. And so maybe the first step is just realizing you're in the same boat as a lot of other people. And often reaching out for help from those people, from our own AI tools, et cetera, can help you get unstuck and keep going. So I'd encourage you to find community and realize you're not alone in that feeling. Um, yeah, honestly, if it were coming easy and if it were just a matter of like solving problem after problem, like what would be the point of the exercise anyway? So yeah. like it should um, be challenging, I think, for someone to get something out of it. And we've all felt the same way, ever more so when you're learning some new language, some new way of thinking. So I really wouldn't um, think poorly of yourself. Yeah. Just takes time Definitely. and practice. Mm -hmm. How about, let's see, time for one more question here. All right, Carter, a challenge. Oh. Is it possible to explain pointers in two to three minutes? Hmm. Mm. Well, perhaps. We'll say, you know a computer has to store uh, characters or places of memory, like some place inside the computer. And we call that place an address. A pointer is like a variable, which I'm familiar with, that just kind of points to an address. That was, and you have time left over. Time in left fact, over. what would you like to share with folks in your remaining 75 seconds? Uh, I mean, just thank you all so much for coming. It's great to see you off on top of Sanders Cedar. Indeed, thanks yeah. so much to our friends at Memorial Hall who kindly let us come up here, to Vlad and to Max who are holding the camera. And in fact, we thought we'd end just as we began with a beautiful panoramic shot here of Harvard University and indeed Cambridge. So with all that said, this was CS50 and this is Vlad on camera. <laughs>